All right. Looks like we're ready to get started, so let's begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to From Human Rights to Human Rights and Civil Rights. Today we look forward to a presentation by Julian Bond. This is in the celebration of the 25th anniversary of the Deaf President Now movement, or DPN. DPN was a civil rights movement for deaf and hard of hearing people. We all know that it resulted in the first deaf president of Gallaudet University. This was a time when the campus community, the deaf community, and the world community united for change. You know, DPN is synonymous with self-determination and empowerment for deaf and hard of hearing people. And with that, it's appropriate that we host Julian Bond during the 25th anniversary of DPN. His story is an inspiration to all of us. His life includes so many accomplishments. It's very difficult to select which one of these to mention during the introduction for him. Julian Bond has been a social change activist since the 1960s. He was an activist for peaceful anti-segregation protests. All of this while he was a student at Morehouse College in Atlanta. He was an activist when he helped form the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or the SNCC. And he was an activist when he served for more than 20 years in the Georgia House and Senate. During the 1968 presidential election, he was the first African American proposed as a major party candidate for vice president. Bond was the first president of the Southern Poverty Law Center. This is an organization that combats hate, intolerance, and discrimination. Bond served on the board of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. In addition, he was elected as its chairman, serving from 1998 to 2010. Bond holds more than 20 honorary degrees and has received many awards for his work. We are absolutely delighted that he's here with us today at Gallaudet University. And with that, please join me in giving a warm Gallaudet welcome to Julian Bond. Thank you for inviting me here. My first involvement with disability rights came in April 1977, when Section 504, the regulations implementing the American Rehabilitation Act were pending, waiting to be signed into law. Without 504, there might well be no Americans with Disabilities Act that finally put disabilities on a par with gender and race in the pantheon of federal civil rights laws. I joined a protest in San Francisco, part of a nationwide demonstration at the Health, Education, and Welfare offices, now called Health and Human Services. We were there to insist strong regulations be adopted. Section 504 would force hospitals, universities, any place that got federal money 
to remove obstacles to services and would provide access to public transportation and public places for persons with disabilities. It was the first civil rights law guaranteeing equal opportunity for persons with disabilities. Although I didn't stay very long, the sit-in of 120 plus disabled people at HEW in San Francisco lasted 28 days and was critical in forcing the signing of the regulations almost unchanged. The Americans with Disability Act of 1990 extended Section 504 to much of the private sector. Before Section 504, responsibility for the consequences of disability rested only on the shoulders of the person with a disability, rather than being understood as a societal responsibility. Section 504 dramatically changed that societal and legal perception. I was happy to have played a small role in bringing about this important change and a bigger role in the civil rights movement that made it all possible. In 1968, the year he was killed, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about the successes and the failures of the modern civil rights movement. He said then, while this period represented a frontal attack on the doctrine and practice of white supremacy, it did not defeat the monster of racism. If we are to see what is wrong, we will have to face the fact that America has been and continues to be largely a racist society. And the roots of racism are deep in this country, started a long time ago. Racism is a faith, a form of idolatry, started the dogma that one ethnic group is condemned to eternal inferiority and another ethnic group is somehow given the status of eternal superiority. It's not based on anyone going out and studying the facts and then coming back out of it and saying that as a result of experimental studies that these people are behind because of environmental conditions. Racism is based on ontological affirmation. It is the contention that the very being of a people is inferior and the ultimate logic of racism is genocide. King was speaking almost 350 years after racism, white supremacy, was introduced in this country and 45 years ago, but he might as well have been speaking today. He could have been speaking of Trayvon Martin or Barack Obama. Racism is the subordination of blacks based on skin color. It is a self-perpetuating system of advantage based on race. It is prejudice plus power. White supremacy is the ideology that justifies white domination. Dr. King described it as a faith, a form of idolatry. No other ethnic group except American Indians experienced a comparable mix of xenophobic attitudinal and structural limitations and dictatorial constraints on their development. It is absolutely without parallel in the American experience. Now we tend to think of racism in terms of individual behavior and individual actions, but it is a complex set of societal actions and attitudes. There are two kinds of racist behavior, active and passive. They are conscious and unconscious, and each provides benefits, both material and psychological, to its practitioners. Active racist behavior involves walking forward at top speed on a moving sidewalk. Passive racist behavior is standing still on a moving sidewalk, but the sidewalk carries the riders forward nevertheless. Unless the standees turn around and run backward, faster than the sidewalk can carry them forward, they receive the same benefits as do the active racists who are racing forward at top speed. For all their years in the United States, black people have struggled to find answers to a series of questions. How do we explain the position of blacks in society? Who or what is the enemy? Who are our friends? With whom can we join in coalition? What is the nature of whites? Are they naturally hostile to blacks? Is it impossible for them to abandon the benefits they receive from racism? Unlike Polish Americans or Germans, Italian or Irish Americans, all of whom became colorful ethnic variations 
on the central all-American theme, African Americans remain the indigestible alternative. Unlike all the others, they refuse to agree to white supremacy. And unlike all the others, black ethnic mobilization has been often characterized and demeaned as identity politics, somehow democratically illegitimate, while white variants like Puritanism, the Confederacy, the Ku Klux Klan, the Moral Majority, the Tea Party, and others are simply ordinary expressions of democratic activism. Regardless of which type one follows, or which ideology one adopts, or which organization one joins, since black Americans have been part of the body politic, their ideology and the politics that instructs them and mobilizes them has been group-based and racial. They believe in a linked fate, that individual life chances are tied to the fate of the entire group, and that the group shares a common set of historical experiences and a collective identity. That common identity comes from individual interaction, informal and informal social and political networks, schools, churches, media, family, organizations, shaping the shared historical experiences into a sense of collective identity. That identity can be confusing. That two African Americans agree on a linked future does not mean they agree on the best path to advance their interest. Much of what I've said is also true of deaf people and your movement. Your common experiences led to a sense of collective identity. You may have differences as to means, but your goal, goals are group-based and your futures are linked. In the movement for civil rights, my colleagues and I always thought we were engaged in a larger and even more important struggle. We were engaged in a struggle for human rights, enveloping every human being everywhere on the planet. Almost 50 years ago, Bayard Rustin, an advisor to Martin Luther King, and the man who organized the 1963 March on Washington wrote, the civil rights movement is evolving from a protest movement into a full-fledged social movement, an evolution calling its very name into question. It is now concerned not merely with removing the barriers to full opportunity, but with achieving the fact of equality. From sit-ins and freedom rides, we have gone into rent strikes, boycotts, community organization, and political action. As a consequence of this natural evolution, the Negro today finds himself stymied by obstacles of far greater magnitude than the legal barriers he was attacking before. Automation, urban decay, de facto school segregation. These are problems which, while conditioned by Jim Crow, do not vanish upon its demise. They are more deeply rooted in our socioeconomic order and are the result of the total society's failure to meet not only the Negro's needs, but human needs generally. Rustin's analysis speaks to other social movements too. The transfer from protest to politics must engage each of them or they are lost to irrelevance. This does not mean that protest strategies must be abandoned. Rather, they must be bolstered by the strategies of political engagement. What is a movement? One description of that is a community of language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a community of culture. Unfortunately, that description comes from the dictator Joseph Stalin, but even a stop clock can be right twice a day. <laughs> Movements have been critical, crucial in our national history. As Francis Fox Piven writes, movements forced elites to inaugurate reforms that they otherwise could have avoided, even as when the writers of the Constitution, built to popular enthusiasm for direct democracy and ceded to voters the right to exec elect representatives to the lower house, or when the 13th Amendment was passed during the Civil War, ending chattel slavery, or later in the 19th century, when Congress responded to widespread agitation, among farmers and workers with legislation to curb monopolies, or in the 1930s when the national government finally granted workers the right to organize and inaugurated the first government income supported programs, or when the southern apartheid system was struck down in response to the civil rights movement, or when the anti-war movement helped to force the withdrawal of American forces from Southeast Asia. And here, here at Gallaudet, the deaf president now DPN movement gave Gallaudet its first black president. I'm going to give you some guidelines that were drawn to fit the movement for black civil rights. 
but I think you will see that they fit the movement that brought a deaf president to Gallaudet, just as they also fit most of the other social movements we are familiar with across the United States. Movements typically begin with a concrete precipitating event, but are usually the result of known or shared incidents on the part of their participants. In Montgomery, Alabama, that concrete precipitating event was the arrest of Rosa Parks on December 1st, 1955. Nothing quite so dramatic happened here, but the resignation of President Jerry Lee on August 24th, 1987, could be seen to have been an important trigger that fueled the Deaf President Now movement that arose on Gallaudet's campus. As I describe how movements are made, those of you with memories that stretch back to 1988 should see that if what I de depict fits your recall of what happened here on this campus. A single incident may begin a social movement, but if the movement is to grow and succeed, it has to use certain me mechanisms. It must continue agitation, it must foster fellowship, it must sustain morale, and it must develop tactics. Those of you with good memories who remember the Death President Now movement did all these things. Successful movements generally share four conditions. First, they commonly draw from a pool of pre-existing social organizations for experienced leadership, for organized likely supporters, for communication networks, for a financial base, and for workers. The ability to draw from an already existing organization diminishes a movement's startup cost. It gives a movement stability in its inception, the beginning days or weeks when it is most susceptible and most vulnerable to a challenge by the dominant group. Next, successful movements require catalytic le leadership, leaders who can either originate or understand the correct occasion to challenge the group's inferior sta station. Such leadership must be able to encourage and stimulate the movement's followers to join an adventure without a foreseeable end, a struggle which may last for an extended period of time. If these two requirements are combined, already existing leadership from already existing organizations, the movement will be more robust. Pre-existing organizations have already demonstrated the characteristics of success. Their very existence proves they're able to attract supporters and raise money. When the leadership from a social movement comes from these circumstances, the major task is to redirect existing energy and activity toward a new goal rather than building a brand new organization from scratch. Next, a successful movement taps outside resources. It raises money. It attracts supporters from outside its immediate environment, from locales not immediately affected by the success or failure of its struggle. This assistant may be infrequent. It may come with conditions, but it can be useful to the movement's success. Groups suffering domination by others have little to lose by attracting outsiders to their cause since their local decision-making mechanism does not seem likely to yield positive results, any additional support from any source will presumably be to their advantage. And finally, the movement must have a strategy, a plan, a set of tactics, and an approach it adopts or designs to confront its suppression. To be successful, its approach must unsettle the existing order. It must instruct the movement's fellowship and supporters about both the inequities the protesting group suffers and the tactics employed to overcome them. It has to provide hope, some expectation, that the movement must succeed. It must push the structure against which it protests and struggle towards some change, some relief from the injustice it confronts. Describing the origins of the base of the movement activity in black communities, sociologist Alden Morris writes, by the 1950s, Southern whites had established a comprehensive system of domination over blacks. This system of domination protected the privileges of white society and generated tremendous human suffering for blacks. That system controlled blacks economically, politically, and personally. Morris called it a tripartite system of domination. Economic oppression kept blacks in the lowest paid, dirtiest jobs. Political oppression excluded blacks almost absolutely from any participation in public affairs, including the most important of all, casting a vote. Personal oppression reinforced the other two. It included laws separating blacks from whites, relegating blacks to the worst housing, schools, and other public facilities, denying blacks protections by police. It also included customs which proscribed human behavior. Thus Emmett Till's mother advised him to kneel before whites if he must. 
Southern blacks knew better than to confront whites or argue with them. It was supported by terror, both state-supported and private, random and planned, including ritual human sacrifice carried out by the forces of the state and by private citizens. This system of oppression created as a reaction an environment of protest and collective strength, especially in the urban South. Black churches, colleges, and businesses thrived in the segregated city. Black social and civic organizations and institutions grew as well. These kept alive a tradition of protest that can be traced forward from slavery to slave rebellions, to the Underground Railroad, to protest organizations, to the Garvey Movement, to the March on Washington Movement, kept alive in a protest community of families, communities, organizations, institutions, transmitted across generations. Central to the protest community were what sociologist Morris calls movement halfway houses, organizations which, despite a lack of prominence, played important roles in the civil rights movement. He describes them as a group of organizations only partially integrated into the larger society because the participants were actively engaged in bringing about change. They are distinctive, he writes, in their relative isolation from the larger society and the absence of a mass base. They lack broad support and divisible platform, but halfway houses are valuable to emergent organizations and movements. They can provide resources, skilled and experienced activists, tactical training, protest songs, educational activity, and publicity. No parallel between movements is exact. African Americans are the only Americans who were enslaved for more than two centuries, and people of color carry the badge of who we are on our faces. But we are far from the only people suffering discrimination. Sadly, so do many others. They deserve the law's protections and civil rights too. Civil rights are positive legal prerogatives, the right to equal tra treatment before the law. These are rights shared by everyone. There is no one in the United States who does not or should not share in enjoying these rights. The right not to be discriminated against is a commonplace claim we all expect to enjoy under our laws and our founding document, the Constitution. That many had to struggle to gain these rights makes them precious. It doesn't make them special, and it is, does not reserve them only for me or restrict them from others. When others gain these rights, my rights are not diminished in any way. My rights are not diluted when my neighbor enjoys protection from discrimination. He or she becomes my ally in defending the rights we all share. We have gone from civil rights, the civil rights movement has spawned many others, the women's movement, the gay and lesbian rights movement, the disability rights movement, the immigrant rights movement. We have gone from civil rights to human rights, and we are all better off as a result. This is the third year of the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, the war that claimed more American lives than all other wars combined in our nation's history. I recently read an entry from a Civil War diarist, Lucy Rebecca Buck, a supporter of the Confederacy. She was 20 years old and living with her family in Virginia when she wrote, we shall never any of us be the same as we have been. Her words were echoed here at Gallaudet more than a century later when one of the student leaders of the Deaf President Now protest was quoted as saying, things will never, never be the same. DPN did not erupt out of nowhere. For more than a century, deaf people had been engaged in improving their status in America. Fights over preserving American Sign Language, building schools, creating organizations occurred in a world most hearing Americans did not even know existed. The various elements of DPM, students, faculty, staff, alumni, did everything a successful movement must do. Just like the participants in the Montgomery bus boycott three decades earlier, they raised money, they organized, they sought support outside their own community, and they had a strategy. And just as Montgomery had the immediate result of desegregating the city's bus system, so did DPM immediately result in a deaf president for this university. And just as the Montgomery bus boycott advanced opportunity for people of color elsewhere, so was the impact of DPN felt elsewhere too. Protests spread to the National Technical Institute for the Deaf, demanding better sign language skills for the faculty. There were protests over threats to close residential schools in Maryland, Washington State, Oregon, Michigan, and New Jersey, and over curriculum in South Carolina, about administration's faculty and board composition in Maryland and Iowa, <coughs> a 
about the signing ability of chief executives in Mississippi and New York City. As Christensen and Barnett conclude in their struggle of the movement here called Deaf President Now, the impact of DPM on the deaf community has been revolutionary indeed. The hope engendered by the protests has had a mobilizing effect and we predict it will continue to have a long lasting effect on the deaf community. Wellesley College was chartered in 1867, but a woman didn't become president until 1875. Howard University here in DC <coughs> was founded in 1866, but a black person didn't become president until 1926. Spelman College, founded as a college for black women in 1881, didn't have a black woman president until, 18, until 1987. And Gallaudet, chartered in 1964 to serve the deaf, didn't have its first deaf president for 124 years until 1988. Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, the oldest college for black men in America, had only white presidents until 1945 when it named its first black president. That man, Horace Mann Bond, was my father. For we are such a young nation, so recently removed from slavery, that only my father's generation stands between Julian Bond and human bondage. Like many others, some in this room, I am the grandson of a slave. My grandfather, James Bond, <laughs> was born in 1863 in Kentucky. Freedom didn't come for him until the 13th Amendment was ratified in 1865. He and his mother were property, like a horse or chair. As a young girl, she had been given away as a wedding present to a young bride. And when that bride became pregnant, her husband, that's my grand, great-grandmother's owner and master, exercised his right to take his wife as his mistress. That union produced two children, one of them my grandfather. At age 15, barely able to read or write, he hitched his tuition, a steer, to a rope and walked 100 miles across Kentucky to Berea College, and the college took him in. He belonged to a transcendent generation of black Americans, a generation born into slavery, a generation freed by the Civil War, a generation determined to make their way as free women and men. Martin Luther King belonged to another transcendent generation of black Americans, a generation born into segregation, freed from racism's constraints by their own efforts, determined to make their way as free women and men. When my grandfather graduated from Berea in 1892, the college asked him to deliver the commencement address. He said then, the pessimist from his corner looks out on the world of wickedness and sin, and blinded by all that is good or hopeful in the condition and the progress of the human race, bewails the present state of affairs and predicts woeful things for the future. In every cloud he beholds a destructive storm, in every flash of lightning an omen of evil, in every shadow that falls across his path a lurking foe. He forgets that the clouds also bring life and hope that lightning purifies the atmosphere, that shadow and darkness prepare for sunshine and growth, and that hardships and adversity nerve the race as the individual for greater efforts and grander victories. Through your efforts here at Gallaudet, you have achieved great victories. I wish you greater efforts and grander victories in the future. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Ms. Bur Mr. Bond, for those inspirational words. I would like to open the floor now for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please line up on either side of the stage, and we'll just take turns going back and forth to either side. So who would like to be first to ask a question? Please come forward. Hi, my name is LaToya. I came here to hear your presentation, and I enjoyed very much your remarks particularly your comment about uh, the links between the black community and the deaf community. One of the big problems in the deaf community is that our community is so very focused on issues of autism that we really neglect issues of racism. The black deaf community is always trying to get some kind of significant uh, significant attention paid to our issues and hoping to have open dialogues regarding the issues we face, but the deaf community at large seems to push us aside and not really recognize the significance of racism. So in order to incorporate this idea into the deaf community, we first have to recognize its significance and work together as a community. 
Guess I should go ahead and take a seat. Thank you for that question. As you were speaking, it struck me that more and more the movement that more closely parallels the deaf movement isn't just the black movement, but it's the movement of gays and lesbians. In the gay and lesbian movement, obviously there are black people who are gay or lesbian. But typically people in the gay and lesbian movements speak of the gay and lesbian movement as if it were a white phenomenon and aren't conscious that people of color and all kinds of other people as well are part of this community. And I don't think they do it because they are malicious or evil, but just it's so hard to include others when you're so focused on yourself. And if you're the victim of discrimination and prejudice, you tend to be heavily focused on yourself and try to rid yourself of this condition. So I think it's commonplace that, that people of color are often left out of the discussion when movements are involved. And the only thing that will help to rectify this condition is that the people of color have to do two things. Number one, make as much noise as they can and draw as much attention to their own complaints that they can. And this will be more than two things. And we'll have to reach out for allies within the deaf community who be on their side. And that's not hard to do because most people are sympathetic to victims of prejudice. Once they're shown that prejudice exists, they tend to be sympathetic to, to getting rid of it and can easily, maybe not easily, but can be uh, adopted to the movement as, as helpful supporters. I can remember from about the third grade. I was the only black in my class at that time. And I've always had a heart to bring unify, unity among the people, race of people. And I, st I can remember just having a heart to start out of even maybe writing papers or never been involved in, say, um, opportunities to carry forth the movement of bringing unity about the race of people. And I was wondering, as, is, as right now, is there things to get, continue to get involved in, to be a part of, to, I mean, I just have a heart to bring in the race of people together, whether you're deaf, lesbian, it doesn't matter. I just, just, ha just has that, have that heart. And if there's anything that I can continue to do to carry the mantle, because I, I've, I've always, I was about eight years old when I've had that desire from eight years old. Well, thank you for having that desire when you were eight years old, and thank you for holding on to it until yeah. now. Uh, sure, there are many things you can do, but it's interesting, if you listen to, and you can find this, I think, on the web someplace, if you listen to or read Dr. King's first speech to the Montgomery uh, Bus Boycott Organization, when he talks about unity among black people, the applause from the audience, which is almost all black, is just overwhelming. Unity, because they commonly believe that one of the difficulties they're facing is their inability to be unified and that if only they were unified, they could accomplish great things. And so this has been a concern at least from 1950, early 1950s when this occurred mm -hmm. until today and probably will continue to be a concern for years ahead. I think what you have to do is just work on it and work on it and work on it and work on it. And the more you work on it, the more likely it is to occur. Well, but it takes a lot of work. And and there again, not just the unity of black people, just people in general, the right race, uh, just people in general. It's just that I've always, it's just been a heart of, of just people in general of the unifying people, uh, regardless, you know, of the color. And that's but pretty much it, it, is, it is hard, but one of the examples of what I was talking about in the answer to the previous question, I've heard so many people, black people, who are antagonists <coughs> to equality for gays and lesbians, talk about the gay people do this, the gay people do that, the gay people do this, the gay people do that. And they seem to have no consciousness that black people can be gay too. Exactly. Uh, and why this occurs, I don't know. But why is there this blindness about this? I just don't know. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hello there. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to have you here today. I'm thinking about two words that I've heard of recent, inclusion and integration. I think they're very interesting words as we think about modern times. 
and as we look to the future. As we come together in different social movements, obviously we're looking for inclusion and integration, and we pass laws for integration to be a part of what we do in terms of our American society. But what about for people who don't share that common goal? They may face a similar struggle as we do, but they don't share our common goal. Some people move forward to attain these goals and others are left behind. It's not that those who are moving forward to attain the goals of inclusion and integration are the ones that know everything, but if there isn't some way we could come together to share some commonality so that everyone can be on board in the movement and so that no one is left out. I believe the role of the university, in my mind, is to really reflect on some of these issues and to note the areas that we're struggling and see what we can do to change that. We need to have community uh, coalitions formed to come together and really consider the community element. But it's difficult to find that in a community with a community that is so broad and diverse. It is, and you know, what strikes me is how similar these first three questions are. They're asked about different topics, but they really are about the same topic. How do we get the larger number of people engaged in struggles for justice and fairness? How do we ensure that the particular group which feels aggrieved has the largest degree of unity it possibly can? And how do we make sure that people who could be supporters join in? Well, the answers to all these questions are both difficult and easy, I think. It's because I'm speaking up here. It's easy for me to say that. Uh, that uh, the degree to which the organizer the man, the woman, who is working for justice and equality, the degree to which the organizer can reach out to larger and larger circles of people, the more successful he or she will be. The ability he or she has to go to people who don't think they have any stake in this struggle and convince them that they do, again, the more successful he or she will do. So the person who desires this unity to, to occur or de desires this unanimity to grow has got to work hard at creating a larger and larger body of people. And you do that in a number of different ways. You knock on doors, you pass out leaflets, you hold meetings, you hold uh, sessions where people talk about these problems, you argue with people in a nice way, argue with people, you do all the things you can to convince John and Mary and Sue and Bill that they have a stake in this too. Sometimes you can't do it. And after trying for a long period of time, I think it's best to get rid of, not to get rid of them, but to not, not spend all your time on them, but to find other people who are potential allies, and you'll be surprised at how helpful they can be. So you have to make an effort to say, I'm going to take this small group of people who support justice and freedom and make them into a larger group of people and use every effort I can to make that happen. Thank you, and it looks like the next question is from the other side of the stage. Hi, uh, my name is Angie, and I'm a homeless advocate in DC. And one thing I have noticed, um, I've also worked in a food movement, so I noticed that um, I'm a child of the 60s, and I was wondering how we can, I see segregation happening in a strong way in DC, uh, and I'm trying to um, I get in, go to groups like this, and small groups, and discuss this issue about segregation. We, we just starting thing old, but taking us back to the 60s. And uh, the movement that's going on now, a lot of, uh, not to be offensive, a lot of people in my social service area, uh, uh, white America, young, young white Americans coming to DC with this, this notion that, um, of white guilt in my, in, my, in my arena. And there's making sure that they go into the community, keeping the black people in certain areas of the city so they and they're having conversations in the in the communities in those small communities, but they won't come out of the city to try to integrate with everyone else because they believe because they're feeding into the, the, the what happened then into the people our people uh, uh, who have come through it and want to start it all over again. And there is something that's building up now called under, undercover like a 60 movement thing going. We're trying to build. They're trying to build it up. And I think it's going to be a tragedy because I, I grew up here and I, I saw my city destroyed after the riot and during the riot. And 
I see this the segregation happening all over again. Um, not just amongst race, but it's the food and everything else. And where you live. Um, so how do we kind of like tear down that again? <laughs> You know, I've been in, I'm not done with you, you so it said the goal in communities and small groups of talk, and I've done that, but it's like a, a deaf ear. They don't want to hear anything like that. This is how it's going to be. Um, we are free, we as black people are being cheated. Uh, we not getting this, the guy not getting that. And because of that, we're going to do our own thing. But it's not the black people who are saying these, it's the young white Americans who are coming here and feeding more and more into it. Like they went to this history book and they saw this stuff and we're still being discriminated against. So let's do this, let's do that. <laughs> Are you saying that they think this was something that happened in the past and therefore it doesn't it's have to be? What is happening, racism is gonna happen forever. It's gonna be here. You can't, you know, you can, you can fight against it on certain levels. Discrimination is gonna be here, whatever. But if you're fighting by yourself just because you are a particular what um, we talked about earlier, intersection, and that's just your thing, and you, and you want everybody else to be mad and everything because of that that particular thing. You you seg pull yourself out of the arena of the, everybody as a whole in the city, it's segregating all over again. I don't know how. Am I putting it right? <laughs> yes, you're putting it right, and I'm surprised you describe yourself as a 60s person. You don't look old enough to be a 60s person. <laughs> Well, we weren't allowed to come outside until after the riot. And I, when I came, when I came on the bus coming to the city, a lot of our stores, that's like, like miles long. And you see anybody know that? The little restaurant, and that was my favorite restaurant. It was masses, Eighth Street corridor, everything was gone. So I see that happening. We're trying to educate people and let them know that we, what happened after the 70s. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what happened after the 60s movement? The positive thing that came out of the 60s movement, nobody wants to think about that. They want to dwell on what that negative part of it. Well, my, my answer to almost all these questions is the same. You have to keep pushing keep and pushing and pushing and pushing and working and trying to enlarge the circle of people you're dealing with and where they seem to be ignorant, and I don't mean stupid, ignorant about the things they should know more about, then educate them or, or point them towards some source of education where they can understand exactly what's happened and what's needed today. That, that's my answer to almost all these questions. You have to just keep working and working, keep working and working and working, yeah. Don't give up. No. <laughs> it's frustrating, but... You can do it. Thank you. Okay. Hello. What you said about DPN, I'm fortunate enough actually to reap the benefits of, of what's transpired. I've come from a deaf family. My brother and I saw how our parents struggled greatly and how my father, who was a deaf printer, didn't have the same opportunities to get better pay, to get better job opportunities and really move up the corporate ladder as a deaf person. My mother had substandard health care. Um, and mental health care, which resulted some from some horrific consequences. So of course now we can look and see things are so much better. But uh, your wife, uh, Pam, actually asked me a question about um, just before you began to ask to see how society is different now and what challenges we face as a deaf community. I think one of the things we lack, and I'm curious to hear your perspective on how we can address this particular issue, this issue frankly is one of respect. And I think about Hollywood and how in Hollywood they will use people who can hear to act the role of a deaf character, and that's truly an insult to our community. And I think about journalists and journalist guides that are out there and vocabularies that still are used. It's words such as deaf mute are still found in the media, which is very offensive to a number of deaf people. And even of recent, just a couple of months ago, a prominent political figure uh, actually looked at an interpreter who was signing and tried to mock the signs and made a, a very comedic way of kind of mocking the signs. And to me, it was very insulting. I just see a lack of respect, and I think what's even worse in some ways is that if you look how deaf people have just become complacent to all of this, um, to some extent, you know, we should be outraged in response to this, but people seem to be willing to just accept the state of affairs, 
there's this underlying, though, lack of respect, which I think has very negative consequences for all of us. And I'm wondering your perspective, because I'm sure you've f faced common issues such as this in the movement that you've been involved with. Yes, I, as you're talking, I just thought of the commonality of what you were saying, that so many things you're talking about don't resonate with people who have hearing problems or who are deaf exclusively. These are things that happen to all kinds of people in all kinds of circumstances, and it may be that the outrage level has been raised a great deal, for some people anyway, and that what used to outrage people uh, doesn't outrage them as much as it did in the past. I know I see things and I think, oh my word, why did that happen? How did he dare say that? What is this? Why, why isn't anybody making a noise about this? Um, and sometimes I, I, th these things, I, I'm sorry to say, pass me by. I read in the paper something awful, I say, gee, that's terrible, I just go ahead and I do nothing about it. I don't respond to it in any way. Um, I have a friend who writes a letter to the Post almost every day. <laughs> almost every day, because he sees something in the Post that offends him. And when I read the letters, he sends me copies of his letters. The Post never prints them. But, but when I see the letters, I'm usually offended too. And I wonder, why didn't I write the letter? Um, so it may be, on the one hand, that the offense level and the outrage level is, has gone up and therefore fewer people are as outraged against the sorts of things you talk about than they should be. Or, I'm not sh really sure what it is, but whatever it is, we ought to lower our outrage level and become outraged more easily and be protesting more easily. Last week, last Wednesday, I got arrested at the White House with uh, 50, 49 other people uh, to protest uh, the President's um, what we hope would be the president's, to push the president toward greater action against climate change. And who's to say that this uh, will happen or not, or that 50 people getting arrested in front of the White House will have any effect or not? You don't know, but it's something I think I felt I had to do. And all of the people who were with me, Robert Kennedy Jr., his son, you know, has been Dayton Taylor Swift. Uh, <laughs> his son, and an, an illustrious group of scientists and people who are very knowledgeable about felt it important to do this thing and to undergo the inconvenience and tell me if you don't think it's inconvenient, you don't know what inconvenience is, to be arrested on a cold day and have your hands ha hang up behind you, um, how irritating that is. But we felt it was important enough and we got to hope that our fellow Americans, not only on this issue but on a number of issues, feel the same sense of outrage, feel the same, fence, the same sense that an outrage has been committed, that an offense has been committed, and somebody needs to make some noise about it, and uh, we can only hope that the numbers will grow, and I'm, I'm an optimist. I tend to be a person who thinks that good things are going to happen, and uh, I think that good things will happen in all of these areas we're talking, we've been talking about this afternoon, and, and so I'm looking for good things to happen, and I think they will. I'm, I'm sorry I can't say more than that. Thank you for that response. Hi, my name is Boyd. Uh, I'm a student here, and I'm listening to you talk about how uh, gay and lesbian people mimic civil rights. I want to know, first of all, do you really consider it a human right, a civil right? Um, if it is, why is it that we have such blowback from African-American African preachers? from our civil rights leaders such as uh, Jesse Jackson, who is seen as severely homophobic. Uh, why does he not see the parallels? And following that line of thought, as you were the chairman of the NAACP, why is it the NAACP didn't take a stand on marriage equality until recently in May in 2012 and not under your tenure? Well, first, let me talk about Reverend Jackson. I believe Reverend Jackson, who may have said homophobic things in the past, wouldn't say them now. I believe that like many Americans, black Americans particularly, he's undergone an evolution in his thinking and thinks about things differently than he did in the past and would not say homophobic, homophobic things today if the opportunity presented itself, that he knows the error of his ways and he's a better person now than he is. About the NAACP, I'm embarrassed to say 
that when I was chairman of the NAACP for 11 years, I never brought up the issue of marriage equality because I thought my board of directors would vote against it. And I thought I'd rather have the NAACP have no position than have a bad position. And then after I stopped being chairman, I'm sitting at a board meeting, because I'm still on the board, and somebody made a motion for marriage equality, and somebody seconded it. And I said to the guy I said, next to me, I said, what is happening here? And we voted, and we have a big board, 64 people. And we voted, and two people weren't there. So we voted 62, no, I'm sorry, 60 to two in favor of marriage equality, 60 to two. And if you had told me a week earlier that that would have happened, I would have said, you're crazy, it's not gonna happen, they won't do it. But I underestimated the decency and the, and the um, fine feelings of my fellow board members. I'm ashamed of that. I'm ashamed I didn't push it harder at the time, but I really thought if I brought this up, the NAACP will vote it down and the headline would be, NAACP opposes marriage equality. And I didn't ever want to read that in the paper. But I'll tell you something interesting. One of the gay groups did polling of black Americans in the aftermath of President Obama speaking out on this and the NAACP speaking out on this. And he found that most people said, I'm happy Obama did this, but he did it because he's a politician. The NAACP did it because it was the right thing to do. And so I'm proud of that. And I'm proud I was sitting there and could vote for it too. Um, and just one more thing I want to ask you is, um, I, I'm really happy you mentioned Baynard Rustin, but um, I think he has been largely whitewashed, blackwashed, gaywashed out of history. Yeah, he's been gaywashed out of history. Gaywashed because he was an openly gay man, although many do feel that he was, I mean, if MLK was right there, he was the one step below in the importance of the civil rights movement. Uh, why isn't he more well known? And why doesn't the NAACP or other civil rights movements promote him? And if they're having trouble, maybe they need a good student like somebody who's graduating soon who might want a paid internship. <laughs> see, see me after this is over. Um, I, I think you're wrong about Byron Rustin's fixed status in, in the community now. He is thought of today as a revered figure. There's a great documentary about him. Uh, I can't think of the name of Brother, Brother Outsider. There are several books written about him. He has been resuscitated and given new status. And so he, I think he's, he's thought about in a much <coughs> kinder way. I, I knew him and he once held out his hand like this to me and I held out my hand like that to him and he gave me a gold watch which somebody stole from me. Beautiful gold watch with a chain because he used to wear three piece suits and he always had a gold watch chain here and I thought he was so elegant. And uh, he, uh, you know, he was from Westchester, Pennsylvania and for some peculiar reason he spoke with a British accent all his life, which he certainly did not pick up in Westchester. And I was very fond of him and I, I admired him a great deal. One thing he said which I, uh, in, in the early days of the Montgomery bus boycott, he came to Montgomery and he began to tutor King in nonviolence. Because Dr. King didn't know much about nonviolence, didn't know much about his history, didn't know about his practice. And Bayard Rustin once said that Martin Luther King couldn't organize vampires to go to a bloodbath. <laughs> but he was a, a wonderful guy, a wonderful guy, and I, I think he's held in greater esteem now than, than you talk about. Thank okay? You. All right. Hello. Thank you for being here this afternoon. I really enjoyed your presentation. My question relates to this idea of change and how change can actually take place. Obviously, you've been involved in a number of different movements. Um, you know, the climate change one that you just mentioned right outside the White House of recent. In your remarks, you talked about Rosa Parks. You talked about DPN and a number of other social movements. But you also talked about government change, like the passage of the ADA and other laws, uh, anti-segregation -se laws, and you know Brown versus Board of Education, a number of other laws that we could look to. So we get involved in movements, but also I understand that you became a senator for many years, so obviously you see the importance of politics and getting involved in politics as well. Where do you really believe we can begin to initiate change. 
I mean, obviously the government can mandate changes, but whether or not people will actually incorporate those changes and see the relevance of it and the validity of them is another thing. Or does it require, instead of government, more you know, social protests and movements to, to affect change? Or maybe it's a little bit of both. What's your take on that? I'm just wondering your perspective. I think it's, thank you for that. I think it's a little bit of both of those things that you have to have government certify change. And, but then there's another step. The people have to realize change. So if the, I, I don't want to belittle social change, but suppose the speed limit is, is set at 50 miles an hour and people continue driving at 60 or 70 or 80 miles an hour, unless the government steps in and begins writing tickets and arresting people and making some sanction against people speeding, they're gonna to continue to do it. But if the government says, no, we've decided on this limit and we are going to hold to it and we're going to, there'll be punishments for violating this, people will continue to, to misbehave. Same as with civil rights laws, if the government doesn't only says we've passed a law, you can't discriminate against people, but people continue to discriminate and the government does nothing about it. For example, we have fairly strong laws against housing segregation in the United States, but of all the things that the civil rights movement has worked on for decades and decades and decades, ending housing segregation is the area I think we've made the least amount of progress. And we've made the least amount of progress because government, in my view, isn't as vigorous in enforcing these laws as it might have been. It's good over here, it's good over here, it's good over here, but not as good uh, in that. And to the degree that we can now make the government be as vigilant in, in enforcing an end to housing segregation, that's the degree to which housing segregation will begin to go away. But we've got to insist on it. So you get social change, uh, not only when you pass a law to do it, but when the people become accepting of the law, and, uh, and, and begin to enforce it, demand, and, or demand its enforcement. It looks like we have time for two more questions. And after that, our provost will be sharing some closing remarks. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for coming. I really enjoyed your sharing your wisdom with us today. I guess one thing I'm left thinking about, you know, deaf people have fought for a number of years seeking equal opportunities and equal access through civil rights. We still face a number of problems on the area of human rights, and I think where most of the world may look at deaf people as just being people who can't hear and they need to be somehow fixed, like their ears are broken, and that's the perspective from society. That, um, you know, they're being good and positive and kind and want to save us from this tragedy of our lives. You know, how awful it is that these poor people have to be deaf. I'm sure many of you have heard this sentiment, right? And we see that um, not as an awful thing. We see deafness as a wonderful thing. Our challenge is to change people's minds and the way they see us, that we don't want them to see us as being inferior. And that's the number one challenge I think we have is to change people's perspective of us. So the African-American struggles you have relate to inferiority based on a person's race, and you fought successfully to change some of those attitudes. And how this applies to deaf people is that, you know, there's billions and billions of dollars that have been spent on industries seeking to fix the way we can't hear to make us better. So how do we go up against that? Well, in some ways, not, not as fixed ways, the, the analogy between the black movement and the uh, deaf movement in that regard is exact as well. You know, millions, perhaps not billions of dollars have been spent uh, by companies selling uh, creams and unguents to lighten black people's skin so that we won't look the way we do, and we'll look like everybody else. And therefore, everybody else will treat us nicely and kindly. Uh, the same is true with hair straightener, um, and uh, other people, not, not many of course, you know, resort to uh, lip tightening, or shortening, or <laughs> nose. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, so there, there are these comparisons, and I think most black people have gotten by that, but not all by any means. 
but I think most have, and most say it's, it's you know, there's nothing wrong with the way I look, nothing way, that's the way I was born, and that's the way I, I want to be, and that's the way I like being. Uh, so that's not a big, as big an issue in black America as it used to be. Uh, but I think it's a, there's a comparison here between these two movements. I think you just have to, again, and I hate to just keep repeating this, push, 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 push some more, then push some more, and then push some more. You have to keep pushing. These things don't, things don't happen because we want them to. They happen because we make them happen. And to the degree that we make them happen, the more likely they are to happen. Could this be a student of mine? Yes, I am. This is the last question. So, um, it's a strange story, but this past week, uh, there's something, there's a nexus between, between my own religious beliefs and Judaism and my experience growing up in a Jewish community, a part of the conservative movement in Judaism. Uh, yeah, as well as my uh, uh, interest in disability advocacy. What I noticed is I've been very lucky to be included. I couldn't always go as far as I want because I really wanted to be a counselor in the special needs program that I was in. And they, because of certain liability issues, and over time I probably understand this more than my parents <coughs> ever could. And the, 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 the camp is not, the, 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 the ADA does not apply to religious communities, and much of that is after the, the, the separation of the church and state. And I think there has just to be a reigniting of the spirit of inclusion within all religions, and there needs to be more interfaith alliances. Uh, so I, I'm currently, I've, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I reached out to, I can't, I forget, I forget a first, I forget, I forget, Dr. Tucker, or Professor Tucker, I forget her first name, uh, who's the, the, the head of the, the, the Hillel here, and, and tomorrow, uh, some of us are, I'm going to try to make it up to Towson for the deaf awareness uh, Shabbat, but, uh, but the, the, the thing, uh, and I've recently been uniting some other special needs students in my program, I can uh, reach out to, 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 to others and I identified leaders, but the, uh, in a way I feel like when you're teaching the class, it's probably the best class ever because I feel like I'm, I'm living something things happening day by day. Uh, however, the biggest issue right now is I feel like I'm doing it all myself and the rationale I made is because sometimes as a person with so many disabilities, people have had, uh, and I have things that, okay, I'm mad at times where people may need to take care of me more than I can take care of them. I feel like I'm paying it forward and starting to understand what it's like to care for someone with a disability in that way. It, it, but, but I do hope over time I can really push hard and find a way that they have a consolidated leadership, uh, maybe by giving scholarships to people or, or finding the funds for that. So, um, it's kind of a scary feeling because I feel like uh, I'm gonna end up in a situation where uh, I end up embarrassing myself and, and, and just wanna go somewhere else with my life because I'm, I'm just pushing everyone and no one's listening. It, 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 uh, but but I, however, I know people want to get involved and some of them are just busy. So, so it's, it's an interesting feeling and with Facebook, I can kind of capture things around, but things can happen day by day to connections, but I'm still doing 90% of the work. What are your suggestions? My suggestion is that you keep at it. Don't you ever think that nobody's listening? Don't ever think that all these people are listening. All these people are understanding what you're saying, and they will in turn tell others that they saw you. Guess what? A young guy was the last question, asked the last question, and he asked an interesting question about how you keep pursuing these issues without the giving in to the disappointment 
and the no-sayers, and the people who say I'm not interested. So don't ever think that nobody's paying attention, because people are paying attention. This young man is in my class at American University called The Politics of the Civil Rights Movement, and he is aggressive in pursuing answers to his questions. The class doesn't go by without him speaking at least twice. And don't think I don't pay attention, <laughs> because I do pay attention, and I'm glad to see you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for all of you who've asked those great questions, and we heard some wonderful responses. I'd like to invite our provost up now to share with us some closing remarks. But I also first wanted to thank you, uh, Mr. Bond, if you'd like to have a seat for a moment. Thank you very much. Boy, that's just brought chills to me after hearing, as we did today. I'm very much inspired by your remarks, Mr. Bond. As he was speaking, I noted a number of parallels. Uh, deaf people and the struggle that we faced trying to get equal access and seeking equal rights and his remarks. We have much to learn from the African American community and all the work that's been done within that community as well. I'm sure the African American community has much to learn from us. One quote that struck me though as I was sitting back here reflecting on your remarks, it, it actually touched me so that I, I noted it down here. For a just an equitable society to exist. We need a variety of groups coming together, deaf communities, African American communities, and the quote reads, we should not remain in conflict, but rather in congruence. And rather than working in opposition and competition, we should work in coalition and together side by side, such that everyone benefits by living in a just and equitable society and having a government that represents people justly. We are indeed very honored to have you here with us this afternoon, Mr. Bond, Professor Bond, and your lovely wife, Pamela Horowitz. Um, it's wonderful to have this uh, civil rights issue brought before of us, and uh, we really am so happy to have you here. We do have a small memento that we wanted to give you in recognition of your time with us today. If you would please join me on stage. So, you know, this is a community where people are often disenfranchised. And when that happens, we become collectivists in the way we relate with one another. We do things together as a collective identity would. On this pen, what you see here is something that was made by the community as a whole after we all came together and agreed upon something. The president told everyone that we were to come up with something that we all could agree on and this represents, on this pen here, our community solution. So this is something that uh, was done during President Hurwitz's uh, term. Do you see the markings here that represent somewhat of a swoosh? That is representative of the way we produce the sign for Gallaudet. I don't know if you can note the way it actually is represented in the image and the way it's created in sign language. So again, continuing with this notion of a collectivist community and recognizing your membership as part of that collective community. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for being here this afternoon.